Hi everybody, welcome to my homestead and welcome to my channel. My name is Jared. Yesterday, Jenica and I were going for a Sunday drive, like we usually do, and um, I was kind of like, not all too enthused <laughs> during this particular drive about the second coming, just... There's like so many things I've been going that have been going on, but at the same time, it just feels like, you know, other times it just feels like it keeps getting pushed off into the future, and it's just like, oh, when it, when is it ever going to happen? And I've asked before, you know, uh, on different videos, like, what is the last year supposed to look like before it happens? Is it going to be super big and obvious? For some people, the answer is yes. For me, the answer is no. Because I think things can happen very quickly, and uh, some things will happen in a way that we don't think. So, I don't know. In my mind, it could happen really anytime. I'm not really expecting, as you may know, a big grand appearance to the New Jerusalem, based on the quotes that we read in a previous video. It seems like that's been just an ongoing process. As far as Adam on Diamond goes... Um, I don't even really know what that's supposed to look like, uh, given the fact that it's supposed to be broken up between different sessions and whatever. Things could happen really quickly, all within like a week, maybe. I, I don't know. But uh, as me and Jenica were talking, I was having some realizations, uh, just things that I've kind of like put on the back burner, that uh, when you put it all together, kind of makes sense that it would be sooner than later. So let me show you what I mean. There's basically four main uh, things, main events that could indicate uh, when the Lord would choose to come, uh, like before these things happen rather than after they happen. So let me show you what I mean. Before we do that, I want to show you the update on uh, the Flood the Earth Challenge. Uh, we've had a couple more baptisms, so now we're at 14. We've gone from 12 to 14, and these were two different people, by the way, reporting these baptisms. And then uh, one of them, uh, they reported the baptism, and of course that goes along with missionaries, so that's why the missionary is up. But really, it was two baptisms. They had already been meeting with the missionaries. This is crazy, man. I, I, I don't know, like, this is just... <laughs> This is really fun to watch and really interesting to see, and I just I hope this keeps progressing the the way that it is. Uh, we're at a total of five thousand three hundred and eighty five copies of the Book of Mormon that have been shared, and um, seven more people have joined the challenge. So now we're at five hundred and twenty seven people that have shared the Book of Mormon. Uh, I want to share this with you really quick. Uh, the person, one of the people that reported a baptism, they sent a picture and then I want to read the email. Here's the picture. Okay. So it's him right there. Uh, just, just awesome. Okay. Uh, this is from Jan. Hi, Jared. I promised I would share our neighbor and friend's baptism. We shared a book of Mormon. This picture is of Bobby 81 who got baptized today. His conver his conversation, uh, his conversion story is incredible. It's one for the books. He's already met two general authorities from a request from our local mission president. Uh, this picture shows five of his family members and a stake president out of our boundaries that baptized him. Okay, so these are his family members. Five of them. Well, yeah, five, including the little girl, girl, the little girl right here and then a stake president. Okay. Uh, that's a whole other story on how he got involved. Uh, Bobby's family is coming to church tomorrow for his confirmation, and some want to learn more. <laughs> his son is reading the Book of Mormon that Bobby gave him before his baptism. Bobby's friends are also also desiring to learn, and one has taken two discussions. This is this is just amazing. um, I have no idea how far reaching this will go, but this is rolling forth in a beautiful way. Thank you, Jan. That is just amazing. And um, congratulations on that. You know, let's let's do hope that this continues rolling forward to the rest of his family and friends. But it's just amazing. It, it, it reminds me of like, I can't remember who told the story, but there was the story of like, I think it was a general authority 
or somebody, well, maybe it was just some person that, you know, they went on their mission. This was back a long time ago. And uh, they're like, after the, the guy was done with his mission, he's like, uh, people asked him, like, did you have any baptisms? And he's like, oh, all I did was just baptize a little redheaded kid. But then it turned out that that redheaded kid, like, was strong in the church and then had a family and it just affected generations down the line and it like really spread just because of you know just him and hopefully this is like another situation like that where he has a big influence on uh those that come after him and his family and so on and so forth so it's really great okay so um four main things so i guess let's just start with this one with the eclipse uh, we know that there's these two eclipses. Uh, not this one right here. I'm not talking about this one. I'm talking about this one uh, that's going to go through Maine, New York, Ohio. This is coming up in 2024. And this one seems to be related to the one that happened in 2017 that came the opposite direction. And they make an X over Carbondale, Illinois. It's in the southern tip of Illinois. The thing about these eclipses, if you haven't seen my previous videos, is that the path of totality, okay, where you get the full effect of the eclipse, between the two eclipses, they go over major church sites. The one in 2017 went over Adam on Diamon, Far West, Independence, Missouri, Fort Leavenworth, and other uh, major church sites. Okay, if you go to your scriptures I'm going to show you go to study helps go to church history maps okay and I, I've done this in another video I'm not going to recreate it here because um, I'd have to find all that stuff again but let's take a look at this one Missouri and unfortunately the, the image that they provide is not that great but uh, the eclipse covered all these red dots right here. Not these ones up here so much, like winter quarter. Well, I can't remember if it went over winter quarters. I don't think so. But it covered all these ones here that are in Missouri, and then this one in Kansas, Fort Leavenworth. Okay? Covered all these dots. Significantly, we know that Independence, Missouri, is the center place for the future New Jerusalem. And I pointed out in those previous videos, as you looked at the path of totality, it couldn't have uh, varied even by just a few miles. Otherwise, all these red dots uh, would not have been included in the path of totality. Either like Adam on Amon would have been missed, or if it had gone a little bit further north, Independence, Missouri would have been missed. Okay, so it went over all these. And then the one that's coming up in 2024 goes over all of these. Not, not necessarily these ones right here, but it goes over these up here in um, this part of New York, uh, like the northwest, I guess you could say, or the western part of New York, which would include the Sacred Grove near Palmyra, right? And then it goes on down here, it covers all these red dots, uh, significantly Kirtland, Ohio, which was the, the first modern temple, the first temple that had been built since the destruction of the temple by the Romans after Christ. So uh, these two eclipses are, are, they're highly, highly significant, I think you could say, specifically to our church. You already have all these other Christians that are looking for signs of the times. They recognize that it's significant, but if they were to like convert to our church, and then look at this detail that these eclipses go over all these different places, like places where Jesus Christ has appeared or will appear, God the Father himself in the sacred grove. Okay, so these two eclipses, in my mind, uh, are sending a specific message to us, members of the church. And I don't know exactly what the message is, other than, like, be on alert. I think I think you could safely say we need to be on alert in regards to uh, the the proximity of the second coming. Is it going to happen uh, between the two eclipses? I don't know. Is it going to happen afterward? Uh, it could. I don't know. 
but this is one of the, one of the things to look at is um the fact that we have this upcoming eclipse next year let's see i have it here on my timeline it's going to be on the 8th of april of 2024 and uh, i was wrong in the past uh, i made this mistake uh, where i was thinking that it was the day after general conference but it's not because let's go here general conference next year in april it's going to be um it's going to be the 30th wait no that's not right no it, it, no yeah in april next year it is going to be the 6th and the 7th because the 6th is the first saturday of that month yeah so no it is going to be the day after conference sorry i guess i messed up i was thinking of another general conference i guess so uh that eclipse is going to happen the day after general conference weekend on the 8th and i think it's significant that it's the 7th and then the 8th because uh you know don't mean to be a broken record but seven means completion perfection and then eight would be the start of a new cycle which i believe is why uh that's the age of accountability it, it, i think it's mostly for symbolic reasons it's probably it's probably even more than that but i think that's part of it you know the starting of a new cycle so when you look at that and you think about the eclipses being being geared toward us the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and then this happening the day after conference and that day is the eighth the beginning of a new cycle it may just be that uh before or after is when the second coming is going to happen uh, whether it's adam on diamond or whether it's coming to the jews or pick whatever appearance you want something around this time so if it's if uh if he intends to come between the two eclipses then that means sometime between now and april of next year so that's something to think about could be wrong it could be wrong remember there is another eclipse uh that's happening this year in october and this eclipse is also uh, I, I feel like this also speaks to our church because it's going to go through utah and then it's also going to go through corpus christi which is in texas which you know that means like body of christ essentially i, I think that's what that means that's latin but like in spanish cuerpo is is body and then obviously christi would be christ so i think that means body of christ um or something similar so i think that that could be significant we looked at albuquerque which means um it's been a long time since i looked at this but i think albuquerque means uh oak it's like a type of oak in spanish etymology um give me just one second i think i found this out from wikipedia <sighs> usually it has the etymology here i could have sworn oh okay uh the spanish town na or name is believed to stem from the latin alba Quercus which translates in English to white oak which is interesting because we have president oaks i feel like he's going to be either the the prophet of the second coming um or the first prophet after president nelson uh like where his presidency would start sometime uh, at the beginning of the millennium so anyway there's just that little detail but let's go back here to this map so here's the one in 2024 that we were just talking about that goes through major church sites and then there's this one coming up sooner in october and it goes over you know pretty much the midsection of utah it doesn't go over salt lake it doesn't go over saint george 
Um, I can't think of anything really of significance that's in this part of the state, but just the fact that it's going over Utah, um, that's interesting. And that could be some other kind of indication. Maybe it's a hint. Maybe what we're supposed to do is think about the two main eclipses, and then you have this one that, that takes place just a little bit before this one. And so maybe it's an, an indication that uh, he's going to come a little bit sooner. He's going to come a little bit sooner than the 2024 eclipse. I don't know. I, I mean, put your thoughts in the comments below. What do you think? I don't know. But uh, it's something to pay attention to. Okay, so that that's the first thing. Is that it may be that the plan is for him to come before the 2024 eclipse in April. Um, another thing, so now we're going on to number two. Number two is President President Nelson and his birthdays. I feel like his age could be some kind of indication as to when the second coming would happen because, because of everything that he's done as president of the church, whether he planned it or not, because a lot of these things have been in the plans uh, before he was president of the church, but during his presidency is when so many significant things are happening. During his presidency is when uh, the Rome Italy Temple was dedicated. It's when we had the April 2020 General Conference. He has been the prophet that has announced the most temples. Uh, he beat uh, Gordon B. Hinckley April uh, 2022. That's when he beat that record. And uh, where when he had announced 100 temples. I think Gordon B. Hinckley had announced something like 93 I believe it was 93. President Nelson announced 100. And then in the April 2020, or the sorry, the October 2022 General Conference, he announced 18, which brought the entire number of temples throughout the church to 300 between all different phases, constructed, in operation, um, under construction, or announced. 300. Okay. Okay, so he's done a lot. Uh, you might recall this tracker that I've done where I've uh, narrowed down these significant phrases in I uh, sorry phrases, terms, words. Um, I've limited it to presidents of the church and how many times they have said it in talks. And uh, as you can see for second coming, President Nelson takes the cake. Um, I had make, made a mistake in the past with Ezra Taft Benson because there's an Ezra T. Benson, and I accidentally counted his, uh, Ezra T. Benson, Benson's mention of Second Coming. But um, anyway, Ezra Taft Benson is the next highest with 21. But if you look at these two, President Nelson, President Benson, compare them to everybody else, uh they, they talk about it quite a bit, which leads me to believe that President Nelson may have something to do with the second coming. And I wanted to see, you know, how does he stack up against uh, the other apostles? So in order of seniority, starting with uh, President Oaks and then going this way, uh, none of them compare uh, to him. President Nelson has 22 None of them even come close. And then over here in column I, I have the totals. If you were to total all these up, all these different phrases, second coming, last days, hasten, comes again, millennium, hastening, he returns. And President Nelson definitely takes the cake. It goes President Nelson, um, and then Ezra Taft Benson. And then you, ha you do have a lot of talk in the early days of the church. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff. But if you look at more recent times, no one comes close. Just no one comes close. Um, President Nelson, by quite a bit, um, aside from Ezra Taft Benson. So, and uh, he became, President Nelson became the oldest apostle or prophet of this dispensation uh, when he turned 98 this last year. Uh, if you go by months, then technically it was before his birthday. But if you're just going by birthday, 
then September of 2022 is when that happened. Let's see. I'm going to find it. September 9th, right here. September 9th. That's when he became, by years, not months, but by years, the oldest prophet and apostle of this Latter-day Dispensation. So you take all the Second Coming stuff, you take the fact that he he becomes the oldest prophet or apostle of this last dispensation, and uh, you take just all these things that have that have happened during his presidency. It seem it all seems to add up to there's something special about him, and it has to do with the second coming. So, if the Lord wanted to is somehow incorporating this into when he returns. We may want to look at when President Nelson turns 100. And he's going to turn 100. Go back up here. He's going to turn 100 September 9th of 2024. Now, why would 100 matter? It's because, let's say that Christ comes. Let's say that he came next year. Okay, let's say that he comes like in April next year. Um, what that would mean if President Nelson is still living at that time, is that President Nelson would be translated along with the rest of us that are worthy of it and righteous and uh, worthy to move on into the millennium. He would be among the first in the world. Maybe the first, I don't know. But he would be among the first people to not taste death in the traditional way, the way that it's happened for the last 6,000 years. His death would be the new death, which is where you go from being translated, and then you change from translated to being immediately resurrected, sometimes referred to as being twinkled. <laughs> um, and that might be something that the Lord would want to show everybody. You know, to like everybody loves President Nelson, and it would be it would really highlight this gift that Christ has given us through his atonement, that death has been overcome, and we love this prophet so much, and we see him uh, go from translated to resurrected. It, it would be marvelous if that happened. Everybody would love that, and it, it would just really highlight. Um, the new age that we're in, you know, in the millennium. So that's another thing. So uh, he's going to turn 99 this year in September and then 100 uh, in 2024, September of 2024. Okay. Uh, oh, another thing when it comes to his age and him living, uh, most, of you, most of you will recall that we've had this very strange happening uh, the last you know, within the last year where you've had all these different people that are the longest living of their kind that all died within the same, within months of each other, essentially, starting with Shinzo Abe. Okay. He was Japan's longest serving prime minister. He was assassinated. He was at, he was the age of uh, 67 and that was in July. Okay. So just think when you think or when I say these people focus more, not so much on the individual as the country or the organization that they that they represent. So he would represent Japan and think about this as think about this as we go through this list. Think about how all nations are coming to an end and how symbolically, you know, if you compared President Nelson to these world leaders, how he's going strong. It seems like he is going to make it to 100. Compare him to these world leaders of these uh, worldly powers, like Japan. Okay, so you have Shinzo Abe, and then later, just a couple months later, August 30th, Mikhail Gorbachev. He died at the age of 91, the longest living leader of the Soviet Union. And at that time, you know, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union was one of the world superpowers. Queen Elizabeth, everyone remembers that. She died at the age of 96. She was the longest reigning British monarch. And the second longest reigning sovereign 
or you know royalty king or queen uh worldwide uh behind the french king louis the 14th now what is so strange to me is that the next day is president nelson's birthday and that's when he becomes the longest living pro- pro- uh, prophet and apostle of the latter day dispensation I don't think that's coincidence at all. <laughs> Not at all. And then move on. A couple months later, we have um, uh, Jing Zemin, Zemin or whatever passes away at the age of 96. He was the longest living president of China and leader of the Chinese Communist Party. And then you have like some other just strange things like Abigail uh, Kawana Nakoa, uh, age 96, the last Hawaiian princess. I mean, she wasn't you know, actual royalty, but she, she kind of was descended from that family. Um, you have Pele, the king of soccer. He was 82. Um, I don't put as much emphasis on these ones, but I, th- I think they're still kind of significant. Because for some people, they don't care about countries and nations. For them, soccer is their god, or soccer is their world. So, And then you have Pope Emeritus Benedict uh, the 16th. He passed away at the age of 95. He was the longest living pope of all time. So for about 2,000 years, he's the oldest one, and he just joins this club of people. And by the way, uh, his death was on the 31st of December, the last day of the year, as though for some reason he wasn't allowed to see the the upcoming year. I don't know. (laughs) It's weird. It's weird. You know, President Nelson having his birthday after Queen Elizabeth passes away and then the Pope dying the very last day of the year. What? And then the last king of Greece, although he had been in exile uh, most of that time, he still, he was the last king of Greece. Uh, Constantine II passed away at the age of 82. Uh, The princess of rock, uh, Lisa Marie Presley, passed away at age 54. That was in January. And then, okay, (laughs) seriously, the longest living nun of all time, Lucille Randon, passes away at the age of 118 years, 340 days. How is it that the longest living pope for almost 2,000 years and the longest living nun for almost 2,000 years, they, they both pass away within a month of each other? I don't think that you could pass it off as coincidence. I don't. How does that happen? (laughs) None in Pope and then President Nelson and Queen Elizabeth one day from each other. And then all these other things. We've mentioned the Soviet Union and China and uh, Greece, even though modern day Greece has never been like a superpower. Historically, classically, uh, you know, it was a very important country in antiquity. The Catholic Church has been a very powerful entity uh, this entire time. Uh, Japan, it's it's like, and the thing is, is that this cannot be replicated. It's gonna, it would take a really long time to see this type of thing unfold again in the future. But it's doubtful that we're gonna have another Soviet Union, right? Um, it's doubtful that that there's ever going to be another princess of rock. You know, she's called that because of Elvis, her her dad. But for for this uh, series of events to occur again is virtually impossible. <laughs> it's it's virtually impossible. Uh, that's why we I think we have to take a close look at it. Um, I think that's it for oh yeah, and then. We have Jimmy Carter, the longest living U.S. president. (laughs) The longest living U.S. president. He entered hospice care around February 18th. I don't have the actual date. I've looked at I've looked at the different articles, but uh, this is the earliest 
article that I can find dated the 18th of February. So I don't, I don't know, but, and, and he's not looking too good. You know, the fact that he's in hospice care by itself tells you that, he, you know, his days are numbered at this point. But uh, this is what he looked like in 2021. Oh my gosh. Look at him compared to President Nelson. Holy cow. He, he, this man, he looks like, like the living dead. <laughs> <laughs> How is he still alive? Um, and President Nelson looks a billion times better than this. So I don't need to tell you uh, the role that the United States has played in world history and how powerful it's been. There's never been another nation as powerful as the United States. And uh, say he pa say he passes away, you know, soon, and he probably will since he's in hospice care. Um. You know, the, the United States was reserved toward the end of this series. Uh, so that's why there's, the, you know, there's this very curious thing going on with uh, these long, longest living presidents, prime ministers, kings, queens, uh, popes, nuns, right? And in prophets, President Nelson all happening at the same time. That's why I think that it would be very fitting as we look back with 2020 hindsight that the Lord planned it this way to convey the message that his kingdom and his prophet will go on and the kingdoms of the world and the nations and the leaders will not. And then President Nelson, if, if he gets... Uh, goes from translation to resurrection it just tops everything off because 100 is has been recognized as the age that that happens in the millennium you live 100 years and at that point you get changed to uh being resurrected okay so we've talked about eclipses number one number two uh president nelson and his age uh the next one is the salt lake temple Right now, it's scheduled to be rededicated sometime at an unspecified date in 2026. Originally, it was supposed to be 2024, which uh, if that had happened, you would have the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple, uh, presumably uh, before President Nelson's 100th birthday, and then he would turn 100. But now it's pushed back to after his birthday, after his 100th birthday by uh, two years. Um, and we've talked about this before. You know, a lot of people, they, they really do think that this this has to be done before Christ can come because that's the purpose of it being uh, renovated. And that could be true. You know, only time will tell. It may be that, that the world will be spared until the Salt Lake Temple is done. Uh, we know that one of the key aspects of of the of this renovation is uh the earthquake upgrading that they're doing so now but we've discussed also the idea that this may be like a false security for the church maybe maybe intentionally because the lord is going to come at a time when we don't expect it just flat out says that in the scriptures. I think it's in Matthew 24. Let's just look that up really quick. Matthew 24. And I'm not so sure that he's talking about everybody. Okay, let me zoom out. Jeez. Okay, think not. Therefore, okay, I'll zoom in. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. 
Um, he is saying that to his disciples, so maybe by extension you, you could say to us as the church. Um, I do think that those that are watching are going to know, have a pretty good idea of when it's going to happen, and I feel like most of us do. That's why you're watching this channel, is you can feel that it's close. Um, but the thing is, you know, like like Elder like Elder um, Anderson explained in the in the Christmas devotional. In fact, I'm going to read his exact words. Okay, here it is. Okay, he says, <clears throat> thinking about the sacred time of the Savior's birth, why would the Lord wait until the very last night to tell Nephi that he would be born on the morrow? Now keep in mind this is for the Savior's first coming. It's not even the second coming when the world's going to be cleansed. But 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 this is what happened with his first coming. Look, he could have told him weeks or months ahead. Why did he allow Elizabeth and Zacharias to grow old without children before confirming that the prophet John would be born to them? Why did Mary need to wonder about the course before her and Joseph question his place in the story of all stories? Why would the role of a manger in shepherds and angels be unknown until the events took place. Okay. In the pre-mortal world, it was declared, we will prove them herewith to see if they will do all things whatsoever the Lord their God shall command them. In Proverbs, we read, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. In our own times of uncertainty, in our days of trouble and difficulty, in our struggles, let us be faithful. So, as we're thinking about, as we're thinking about the Salt Lake Temple, I, I think that there are people that get um, a false sense of security that we're good. You know, we're good until 2026, and maybe the Lord will want to take advantage of that, not to purposely. Um, you know, cause unnecessary pain, suffering, but because, you know, he wants to come at a time when um, basically you're supposed to be caught either on your best behavior or you're going to be, you know, displaying other some other type of behavior. But we should be doing good at all times. And uh, it, it would make sense to me that he would come before the Salt Temple is rededicated. Because uh, I really, I truly honestly feel, based on comments that I've received from people that I know do not frequently watch this channel, people that just kind of stop by, they're part of the, I guess what you would call the normie kind of crowd, the ones that don't really think about the second coming, the ones that say, well, I don't think that the second coming is going to be anytime soon if they just announce temples. Which makes absolutely no sense because that's one of the primary activities that's going to take place during the millennium is temple work so if anything more temples are going to be announced but occasionally you have these people that don't think about these things and they think that oh no everything's good and they just live their lives they look at the Salt Lake temple and they're like nah it's not going to happen before the Salt Lake temple is uh, rededicated you know so christ coming before that time would be a good time to catch the terrors off guard. I'm not calling you a tear if you think it's going to be after. I'm talking about these people that are basically spiritually asleep, you know. And uh, yeah, sure, he could come after that. I'm just talking about the people that give hardly any thought to the second coming, and they rely on the weakest of arguments like that, that the Salt Lake Temple is not yet rededicated. It'd be a good time to catch those kind of people unaware and unprepared. To, to catch the foolish virgins, so to speak, unprepared. So we got the Salt Lake Temple, okay? Um, if that's his approach, then we only have between now and 2026 before he comes. Okay, so we've talked about the eclipse, President Nelson's age, um, the Salt Lake Temple rededication. Now the fourth one is going to be uh, Israel's 80th birthday. Uh, just a few days ago, on April 26th, they celebrated their 75th birthday. Not according to the Gregorian calendar, but according to the Hebrew calendar. Uh, it's the 5th of Iyar, the month of Iyar. Uh, that's when they celebrate the birthday. So that was April 26th this year. And uh, 
they're going to have their 80th birthday on the 12th of May in 2028. Now, why do I have the 80th birthday? Well, it turns out that that's a really significant age for them uh, when it comes to the nation of Israel. Okay, here we go. The Jerusalem Post. 75, 75 years old is a dangerous age for Israel. Opinion. Israel has entered its greatest crisis after three generations. This happened to the USSR, or the Soviet Union, Turkey, India, and China. What happened to them, and can Israel survive? Okay, so let me just read a little bit of this. A few weeks ago, when speaking of Israel's 75th anniversary, President Isaac Herzog worried whether the state would reach 80 years. The precedents, he said, were not encouraging. Of the two Jewish states of antiquity, one split into two parts uh, that never reunited, and the other lost its independence. The quote-unquote united monarchy of Saul, David, and Solomon is said to have lasted not much longer than 100 years. The Hasmonean dynasty ruled in real independence from 140 to 63 BC, when Pompey occupied Jerusalem 77 years. Uh, both were ruined not by foreign enemies, but by domestic infighting comparable to the events of today. 70 to 80 years, plus or minus two or three, has universally been considered the lifespan of three generations. Their sequence is thought to follow a, a regular pattern. The first generation creates, the second maintains, the third or fourth destroys. Which is interesting because, uh, you know, we find that in the Book of Mormon when we're talking about uh, the people after Christ's visit. Uh, it only lasts for uh, basically four, four generations, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, okay, Israel's in danger at, at 75, a few Israel-specific problems. 70 to 80 has been a turning point for all. For Israel, 75 is the age of danger. Fear of the future, the state is legitimate, but so, but so is hope. From the three core issues above, a few specific Israeli problems are most apparent. And I'm not, I'm not going to go through that, but we've been talking about it on the channel. And I'll put this, this link in the description below in case you want to read it. Um, but there's this idea of the, of the eighth, uh, or yeah, the eighth decade, the, the curse of the eighth decade. Uh, let's read out of this. This is from MiddleEastMonitor.com. The subject of religious prophecies and their centrality to Israel's political thought was once more highlighted following remarks from former Prime Minister uh, Ehud Barak in a recent interview with the Hebrew language newspaper uh, Yediot Aranoth. Uh, Barak, perceived to be perceived to be a progressive politician who was once the leader of Israel's Labor Party, expressed fears that Israel will de degenerate or disintegrate before the 80th anniversary of its 1948 establishment. Quote, throughout the Jewish history, the Jews did not rule for more than 80 years, except in the two kingdoms of David and the Hasmonean dynasty. And in both periods, their disintegration began in the eighth decade, Barak said. So you have this idea Right. Uh, some people call it the fig tree generation. Uh, they use their OK, there's a there's one of the Psalms where Moses uh, defines how long a, a generation is. I want to say it's Psalms 90 verse 10. I could be wrong. But anyway, Moses uh, in that defines a generation as 70 years. But if by strength. 80 years so you have the fig tree generation people they that, th that idea comes out of the evangelical world so i don't know if there's really anything to that um but uh the jews themselves do see this um you know eighth decade issue so we're in that time right now we're right in the middle of that decade and uh this could be another time when christ would decide to come either uh before the 80th birthday or shortly after okay so say for example 
you have the final war that starts up between now and 2028. Well, then Christ would come, he would save the Jews, and uh, before that 80th year, unlike other times, this time uh, Israel would be would continue and would be everlasting. Or it could be that they reach their 80th year, and just kind of like how we read, maybe it's during this decade that things start to kind of fall apart, and then shortly after, say it's 81st or 83rd or 4th or something like that year, that's when the final war happens, and um, and then that's when Christ comes, and, and it would be the same effect. Uh, Israel would continue um, after that because they're they're saved by the true Messiah. So it could be after, or it could be before, but that's another thing to think about. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is the, the furthest out event out out of the four that we're talking about. Israel's birthday, 80th birthday in 2028, the Salt Lake Temple rededication in 2026, President Nelson's, um, his 100th birthday in 2024, and then the second Great American Eclipse also in 2024. So let's say that Christ intends to come before all four of these things. Right. And and it would, I think, make sense that he would come before the Great American Eclipse, before President Nelson turns 100, before the Sali Temple is rededicated, and before Israel's 80th birthday. I think that would make a lot of sense uh, based on everything that we just uh, just discussed. Um, I feel like there was like some other thing. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let me make sure I've got this all covered um i haven't talked about it in a while but uh this year this hebrew year that we're in right now uh is the sunday of years the last hebrew year which went from september of 2021 until september of 2022 was a sabbatical year, or the Sabbath of years, or in the Jewish way of thinking, it, it would be the Saturday of years, making 2022 from September 2022 until September 2023 the Sunday of years. Okay, let's look. Let's look at when uh, the Sunday of years will end this year. Uh, it's actually going to be in Oc. No, wait. This is 2024. Let's look at 2023. So this year, Rosh Hashanah is going to be on the 16th. Well, and technically at sundown on the 15th of September, that's when the new Hebrew year will begin uh, with Rosh Hashanah. And so the Sunday of years will end on the 15th of September. Now, why would that matter? I think it might matter because, uh, for one thing, we read on Israel 365 a while ago that some Jewish traditions believe that that the Messiah would come the year after a sabbatical year. Additionally, uh, we now celebrate Sunday as the Sabbath to commemorate Christ when he was resurrected. He was resurrected the day after a Sabbath. And so now this is the new Sabbath. It's, it's the Lord's Day. It's Sunday. And so if Christ wanted to um, teach a lesson to the Jews that will, you know, the, the ones, cause there's going to be all these Jews that are then converted when he comes and recognize him as the true Messiah. And if he wanted to, like, really underscore that, uh, he may choose to come during a Sunday of years. Just to kind of, like, emphasize Sunday is my day. It's the day that I was resurrected, right? It's part of the atonement. And um, I am the Messiah. I am the true Messiah. Y you get what I'm saying? So uh, he may choose to come during this particular um, Hebrew year. And uh, if he doesn't come before Rosh Hashanah this year, but that's still the plan that he would come during the sat the Sunday of years. Then we would have to wait seven more years, and uh, that's going to be 
let's see, that year would be from like September of 2029 until September or October of 2030. So, and I know some of you are looking at 2030 or, you know, these years right here, 2030 to 2033. So I don't know, maybe, maybe that'll be it. But I feel like there's a chance it could be uh, during this Hebrew year that we're currently in as well. Um, let's see. There's also this idea of the Jubilees, uh, just as a reminder. So there's a couple. OK, so the Jubilee, that's not something that's observed right now in Israel and in Judaism, because from what I've read, it would require for all the 10, all, all 12 tribes to be in the land it has to do with that. So I did some research and I did a video about this a long time ago. And from what they can tell, it seems like the last Jubilee would have been around the year um, 736 before Christ, uh, because it was in the year 721 BC around that time that the 10 lot, that the 10 tribes were, uh, carried away captive by Assyria. So had it continued, I uh, put together this thing, and it is now. If if it was if it was still following that schedule, 2015 would have been the last jubilee, and the upcoming jubilee would have been will be in uh, 2065. Uh, although there's the Book of Mormon jubilee, where there's been commentators and scholars that have said that it it seems like King Benjamin when he spoke, uh, that it may have been a Jubilee year. And so I just did like a rough thing based on the estimate of when he would have, when he would have been speaking and giving his sermon. And so if, if that's correct, then the Jubilee, the upcoming Jubilee would be in 2027. If this is like the more, the more correct, uh, count. Uh, and then there is, an official kind of like observance of the Jubilee by the church, uh, especially within the first, like, uh, like around this time, I think it was 1870 that they actually officially uh, observed a Jubilee as far as like um, the releasing of debts and stuff with land. I can't remember what it's all about. I think it has to do with like land being being given back and then debts being forgiven, prisoners being set free, and then other things. I, I did a video on this a long time ago. I can't remember everything that they did. But what's interesting about that is that 2020, uh, the year 2020 would have been a Jubilee year. And then after that, the next Jubilee year is going to be 2070. That's from the time of the first vision. Okay. Uh from the founding of the church, that's also something I'd have to go back and show you, but I know that there's been like talks, uh, both in general conference and in the journal of discourses that have talked about jubilees, uh, just generally talking about them as 50 year anniversaries, essentially. So the upcoming jubilee from the founding of the church is going to be in 2030. So, and that would be around that time of the, um, what's it called? The Sunday of years on the Hebrew calendar. So, yeah, that, that is a pretty good candidate, I would say. Of course, uh, everything that we're talking about uh, may not have any validity at all. It could all just be pure speculation. And really, that is what it is. But these are just some things to think about. Uh, remember, I want to remind you of one thing, um, end of, oh, where is it? Inning. I want to remind you of something because I think some people got discouraged by, uh, President Eyring's remarks and, uh, Dieter F. Uchtdorf as he visited Israel and he was talking to the students at BYU Jerusalem. Just remember this. This is from President Nelson. This is last year for FSY. He said, let's, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read the first part. You're here now because, now he's sp speaking to the youth, right? You're here now because God chose you to be here now. And that says something crucial and important about you. 
we are living in this final and last dispensation, the only dispensation that will not end in apostasy. Our Father reserved you for now because he knew you. Uh, he knew you would have the courage and the strength to withstand the adversary's coming opposition to God's plan for you. Heavenly Father knew you would recognize truth, and he knew you'd be willing to help carry the message of Jesus Christ and the and his gospel to others around the world. Using a baseball analogy, we are in the last half of the ninth inning. And I'm just going to end it right there. Well, no, then he says, Our Heavenly Father and his Son chose you to be on their team when the game's on the line. So the the bottom of the ninth or the last half of the ninth inning, that's when the that's the very last play of the game. The last time that a team is up to bat. So that should give you some indication as to where we're at. It's very, very close. Right? Sister Nelson, remember what she said? She said uh, in the 2022 Alberta, British Columbia area devotional, uh, October 16th. Two friends of ours who are leaders of MTC but are now serving as senior missionaries in Malta wrote us and said, quote, This conference was the very best. President Nelson, we feel you have asked us to get on the ark. And there's been a lot of other quotes. You know, I'm going to have to go through this whole thing again and uh, add what President Eyring and what Elder Uchtdorf said, but you have to take all of it together. And I feel like there's been so much more said that indicates that it's sooner rather than later. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So those are kind of the, those are the four things that could indicate that the second coming wouldn't happen past a certain point, potentially. One is the eclipses. Two is president Nelson and his age. Three is, is when the Sali Temple is going to be rededicated. And then the fourth is uh, Israel's 80th birthday. So just some stuff to think about. It, it would it'd fit really nicely, but, you know, we can't necessarily count on that. But these are some nice thoughts. And uh, we'll just have to wait and see. All right. If you haven't already, please make sure to subscribe. Like this video if you liked it. Leave your thoughts and opinions down in the comments below. Also, make sure to share it. And I'll talk to you guys later.